Now, moments of genuine legal history are rare in Nigeria, and often they're rarely clear to the public when they happen. But the Supreme Court judgment that's expected to be delivered tomorrow, Thursday, on the opposition's challenge to the result of the presidential election will be watched by millions, and every word contained in that ruling will be anatomically dissected. And whichever way it goes, it'll probably elicit audible gasps. And subsequently, in the months and years to come, it'll continue to have a profound effect on the nature of Nigerian politics up and down this land and beyond. The court can either uphold the decision of the lower court, affirming President Tinubu's victory, or overturn it in a country where a presidential election result has never been invalidated or reversed by a court. Nevertheless, Atiku Abubakar has presented what he says is new evidence to the court relating to the debate over whether President Tinubu had presented a fake educational certificate to the Electoral Commission, INEC, as proof of his eligibility. Mr. Tinubu has opposed the move and has asked the court not to grant his opponent's application. The election petition court had earlier ruled that both opposition candidates, Atiku Abubakar and Peter Obi, failed to prove that the election was flawed, declaring that the petitioners had been unable to demonstrate by evidence or argument that there had been fraud, overvoting and voter suppression. Well, for more on the different scenarios that are likely to emerge from Thursday's Supreme Court decision, I'm joined now in the studio by the international human rights lawyer and expert on Nigerian law, Emmanuel Ogebe, who's also a pro-democracy advocate with the U.S.-Nigeria Law Group in Washington. Barrister Ogebe is in Nigeria to monitor the presidential election trial and the appeals process. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Always a pleasure, Charles. It's not your first time of being here. Though. No, it's During the election we had you here absolutely um, keeping very keenly at the front of your mind mm -hmm. the fact that the appeals process is still under judicial consideration mm -hmm. what are the different scenarios that are likely to emerge tomorrow Thursday yeah. Well, as you rightly pointed out, there are two general scenarios that would occur an affirmation or a reversal but you also pointed out that this is a historic moment and it truly is because there is for the first time in Nigerian election jurisprudence a third option. The third option is that the Supreme Court will accede to the new evidence that is being introduced and what could happen is either of two things. The Supreme Court could remit it back to the presidential election uh, 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 court, petition court and ask them to review the new evidence. Mm. So both parties will thrash out the impact. Alternatively, the Supreme Court could take the new evidence by itself. Now, here's what's interesting. Uh, when the court sat the day before yesterday, I thought that they would take a ruling on the motion to adduce the new evidence. Right. Then we would know At what's that happening. time. Exactly. Yeah. But what they did is they said, we'll roll it into our judgment. Now, we all anticipated that the judgment would come first week of, September, mm. of, of November, November, but they decided to give it now. There are two possible scenarios that would explain why they're doing this. One is, oh, it's a foregone conclusion. They're going to turn it down. But the other is it gives the lower court a little time to tr trash it out. So literally, it could go either way. Mm. Now, in the 2007... Well, when you say it gives the lower court a little time to trash it out... What, what in other words, we have two weeks to the end of the constitutional deadline right. for this to be resolved. So if the Supreme Court orders it back to the uh, uh, Court of Appeal tomorrow, the Court of Appeal can literally sit next week and hear arguments from both sides right. on the issue. So basically what we're saying is for some reason the church, the, the, the court decided not to run out the clock mm. and wait till the last minute to give mm. it. They're giving their decision now. It's either they've made up their minds, we're tossing this out, or they're making up their minds, we're going to allow the uh, court below to right. address this. So it's fascinating, isn't it? It absolutely is. Um, is it a complex picture that is before the Supreme Court in terms of the issues raised by this appeal, one that could create 
a legal dilemma um, for them. Um, again, bearing in mind that this is sub judice. Yeah. Nigerians say sub judice, but it's actually sub judice. That's, what it, that's the way it's pronounced. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and as a so, son of a fellow judge <laughs> like me, you would know these things mm. as well. So here's the point. This case is certainly one that I would consider existential, not only for Nigeria's uh, legal system, but mm. for our democracy and our constitution. Is the constitution what it is, or is it subject to whatever the courts decide to do? Uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, a good judge makes, makes a bad law good, and a bad judge makes a good law bad. Mm. So that tells us we may have a book, but if we don't practice it accurately, it will have unintended results. Now, what makes this very historic, and we must put it in the context, is that uh, Tinubu, Evans Ewerem, and Sali Subuhari were all political actors at the same time, all had the same problems. Two guys bowed out honorably, and he stayed on and on and on and on. And so we see a situation where this has bedeviled the legal system in Nigeria for 24 years. This same guy, mm. this same matter came to the Supreme Court 24 or so years ago. And the, the, the question then was, he has immunity, and so we can't have him prosecuted. And so if the same court that was confronted with this identity of this guy back then comes back and says, well, it doesn't matter anymore, it literally does two things. It annuls 20, over 20 years of legal jurisprudence regarding elections and character and qualification. And let's make, make this very clear. This is not a very deep constitutional issue. There are questions of Abuja FCT, mm. which we all know, and is and, is inclusive. And I don't agree with the determination of the presidential Well, I was going to come to that later uh, on. Election court. But I'm saying that this issue is not a complicated issue. It's a character qualification. Every country in the planet, except North Korea, has a constitutional uh, requirement or a character requirement for its leaders. Mm. So why it's becoming so complicated in Nigeria is a puzzle to the rest of the world. Well, obviously, it would have to be determined within the ambit mm -hmm. of the law yes. and within the context yeah. of the, the historical context yes. as well as the current context of that yeah. um, issue. But in terms of this strategy, yeah. I mean, you, you followed this. Yeah. I mean, you were here, you were going to court, yeah. you were here to observe these yeah. proceedings. Yeah. Um, in terms of the strategy of the lawyers of both um, Atiku Abubakar and Peter B, do you agree with how they set about building what they say is a convincing case, or are you critical of the way they handled their appeal, which clearly didn't do their clients any favors at the election petitions court? Okay. So I will say this, mm. uh, a lot of us miss what I call the sleeper case of APM. Surprisingly, APM had a very good case. In fact, their case was probably you know, more compelling because they met the, the deadlines. Now, what undid the other two major uh, petitioners' cases were technicalities. Mm. For example, um, the evidence wasn't filed alongst with the, alongside the petition, and so the evidence was thrown out. So there were some of those technical glitches we, which unfortunately damaged their cases. But the strength of their cases were more on the constitutional arguments like the 25%. And because the court, you know, basically didn't hold their view, mm. that undermined their case. But very frankly, this was a well-fought case. And I think that if the court wanted to do substantial justice, they would have overlooked some of these uh, issues right. and gone to the meat of the matter. And I'll give you a quick illustration. Look at the PNID case uh, in the UK that just came down this week. Nigeria goofed. Hugely in that case, you know, from the beginning, from the arbitration awards and all of that, Nigeria failed to show up in court. Nigeria's lawyers were compromised, all sorts of things. But the British judge 
looked at it and said, look, Nigeria didn't do get its act right, but I see so much fraud here. Mm. I can't in good conscience allow my fellow Brits to do this to our colony. And so he, he sidestepped all of that. I personally thought we were damn well fortunate mm. that he was a man of conscience who decided to go ahead and do the right thing for the people of Nigeria. And, and that's the same thing that one would expect from uh, the Nigerian courts. We, we shouldn't only imitate the robes and the wigs of mm. the Brits. We should as well you know, follow substantial justice mm. for our nation. And um, the, the other case that, because I mean, the, from that international legal perspective, yes. which you're privileged to yeah. have experience of, I mean, we've had two recent decisions yeah. that affect Nigeria and have turned the focus on it. One yeah. of them is obviously the PNID case yeah. that you mentioned. The yeah. other one is the Chicago CSU certificate yeah. case. I mean, yeah. Again, bearing in mind that it's yeah. sub judice yeah. and this is something that's going to be yeah. in court. I mean, what sort of impact yes. have those cases had mm -hmm. and what might their implications be? All right, so this is another reason why this uh, particular petition is historic. Mm. Because for the first time, external actors and factors were relevant to the case. Mm. Uh, to put it mildly, there is no footprint of um, Bola Tinubu's existence prior to a community college in the UK, I mean in the US. And so we don't have any footprint of him in Nigeria. All we have begins in the, in the, in the US and most of it is dubious, even by his own admission. So if you put his uh, gubernatorial INEC form next to his uh, presidential INEC form, they contradict each other. And so nobody's claiming that he is fake, he himself said he is fake. You know, so he submits names that are not his names and so on and so forth. So the, the primary source mm. challenging his identity is himself. He's his, he's his own worst witness. And so what happened in the, the U.S. court was really remarkable. Um, you had two federal U.S. judges in the same court where he forfeited almost half a million dollars 30 years ago. Two judges wrote 30-page judgment saying, release the records. Because, you know, to them it didn't make any sense that anyone would want to keep out his college records when he's a president. And he dodged a bullet because he was actually in, in New York at the UN when the judge, when the records were going to be released. And so for the first time in the history of the United Nations, a sitting president of a country would have had his educational records released while he was attending the U mm. UN. So what did happen was the judges were very uh, circumspect. They realized the importance uh, of this issue. And she walked hard over the weekend. The last judge, uh, Nancy Maldonado, walked hard through the weekend. And like the UK judge, released her judgment by email. Mm. And she did that because they all felt as judicial brethren around the world, we want to help the Nigerian Supreme Court do, have the evidence it needs to do the right job. Right. And that's why they didn't waste time in handling the case. So basically, just to reiterate, tomorrow yes. might not actually be the, the final judgment. It, it could just be a ruling on the admissibility of the fresh evidence that Atiku Abubakar wanted the court to admit. So, let me clarify this, mm. because like I said, we've not been down this road before. The court on Monday said they were going to decide on the motion to admit new evidence along with the okay, judgment. Okay, right. Now, conceivably, they could say, look, we find that this should be admitted, and because we feel that this is evidence of forgery. Right. Let's move it back to... We're, we're, we're making a decision now right. to have a fresh election. They could, they could do that. Alternatively, they could say, we have, we're really concerned enough to want to push this back mm. to the lower court right. to look at it. And thirdly, they could say, we want to hear arguments on this. Right. These are all best case scenarios. Right. The worst case scenarios, we've looked at it, this is not new, and we're shutting it down. Well. Worst case scenario depends on who you're talking exactly, to. Exactly, exactly. But, but you, you have quite the unique experience mm -hmm. of straddling the legal worlds of both the US and Nigeria. Yes. And we've seen it here because, yeah. I mean, you were following all those cases yeah. in 
I mean, that case in America yeah. and so on. Do you despair of what you see here in Nigeria as a lawyer who straddles yeah. a, a country where people believe yeah. that it's done right? Yes and also Nigeria, and, and perhaps worry about where the future mm -hmm. for politics and the rule of law yes. in this country lies. Absolutely. Now, I can tell you that because of you know, the interest this case generated in mm. the US, uh, it will be quite disappointing if after all of that happened, after all the hard work of the US judges, that it was poo-pooed in the court here. Well, I mean, you, you, we can't make that uh, assessment because when you use the term yeah. that you just used, yeah. it, it sounds prejudicial to the case. We're, I mean, so so we, we can't say that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I know you're you're in speculative territory, but yeah. even that, yeah. we don't want to go that down well, that route. Okay, I was trying to answer your prior yeah. question, which was, what did I think the impact would be? So I, I address the impact here, but I'm also addressing the impact Well, there. I'm asking you whether you despair of yes. what you see here All right. in Nigeria. I do despair yeah. because I can tell you, for instance, that while I was in the court of appeal during the uh, petition hearing, mm. I received an email on my phone uh, concerning a case in Washington that I was working on. So I was literally on a different continent, but still doing my work in, in right. you know uh, in, in nigeria and we saw the pnid judgment came by email the one in uh, in, in chicago came right. by email and i woke up in washington to watch the judgment delivery and i spent 12 hours glued to the tv my kids literally were saddened that i was there the whole day watching that mm. and we have to improve we have to do better and you know, you will see, for example, that um, the case of the uh, former Deputy Senate President, his trial in the UK, in a UK high court, was, broad, was broadcast. Mm. We have the same U U high court as the UK high court. We are refusing to progress technologically. And unfortunately, we're refusing to progress even in the analytical process of making uh, our judiciary work for our masses. Mm. And, and sadly, it will be quite sad, I think, if the hero, the judicial hero of this week is the British judge in London versus, you know, our judge. Well, we there. don't know that, so we'll have to wait and see. But, but yeah. you're also, yeah. which is probably why you're speaking the way that you're yeah. speaking, yeah. Um, beyond just the, purely the letter of the law. Yeah. I mean, you're also a pro-democracy advocate. Yeah. I mean, you were in the trenches yeah. fighting for democracy yeah. during General Abacha's time, and you yeah. were detained and tortured yeah. over issues to do with the annulment yes. of the June 12, yes. 1993 yes. presidential election. Yes. That election forced you to go into exile exactly. in the US. Yes. Do you see any parallels between that time and now? I mean, you can obviously come and go as you please now in Nigeria, mm -hmm. which you couldn't do at the time. Yes. Well, it's fascinating that you say mm -hmm. this because I was held in uh, Aguda House in the villa. I was one of the few Nigerian activists to be held in the villa and I was tortured in Aguda House. And so a couple of years ago, I was invited to Nigeria for a meeting with the vice president, mm. Osimbajo. And where was the meeting? It was in Aguda House. And I laughed. Did you feel a bit creeped out when you went in there? <laughs> yeah, you know, kind of, sort of. Right. But I laughed to myself. I said, these guys who now occupy these offices mm. don't know about those of us who shed our blood in this office for them to occupy this office. And that's the irony of Nigeria. Now, coming to uh, President uh, Bola mm. Tinubu, he was a pro-democracy activist as well. I met him only once in my life, and that was in London when he was in Nadeko, and I had just been released from prison. Mm. And so I always saw him as a hero of democracy. But we now have him in, pr in the presidency and his path, I don't think, was the ideal democratic path to get there. And that's why I have a bit of uh, uh, concern. Right. I wish that you know, he got there you know, as, a, as the hero we thought he, he was. Right. Now, mm -hmm. one of the issues, mm -hmm. um, I think you raised this earlier, that have emerged in the appeal yes. is the question of the status of Abuja. Yes and whether or not a threshold of 25% has, has to be met in yeah. order to declare someone president-elect. Yeah. Yeah. 
Whatever the outcome of the Supreme Court, do you think that issue, and I'm, 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 we need to be very circumspect, yeah. Yeah. whatever the outcome of the Supreme Court, do you think that issue will rear its head, possibly at the National Assembly, for unequivocal clarification? Yes. Um, or will the courts dispel any lingering questions in, yes. in your assessment? Yeah, I mean, that's a very uh, good question. And the problem with Nigeria has never been that we need to amend the Constitution over and over and over, because we have operators who undermine mm. the very good work that was done on constitutions. This was spelled out in clear language. Now, the courts claimed that there are no special persons in Nigeria, so uh, Abuja shouldn't have the casting vote, so to speak. Uh, on the presidential election. But the fact is, the people of Abuja are disadvantaged. Mm. They have no governor and they have no members of the House of Representatives. What they have is a minister appointed by the president. Mm. And that's why they have the ability to determine who the president is, who gives them uh, their minister. So by denying them that, the people of Abuja have become colonial subjects of Nigeria. Everyone else in Nigeria is a bona fide, full-fledged citizen. People of Abuja are colonial. But, but that's, not, co that's not a question mm -hmm. for the court, is it? I mean, the, the, court's, the court's job is simply to look at the letter of mm -hmm. the law yes. and make a determination yes. based on their interpretation yes. of it and yes. based on precedent. Yes. I mean, and that really is it. I mean, if, if you want to get into the areas you're yeah. getting into, you'd yeah. have to move into a different arena. Well, so I'm, I'm basically matching the court's argument that the people of Abuja are not special. And I'm countering and saying, actually, they're not special, they're disadvantaged. So we need to fix that. And the Constitution fixed that, but the court basically nixed it. Now, what will happen is, Obviously, if they go back for a uh, constitutional amendment mm -hmm. and clarification, the next time we come here, someone else will pull another stone and we'll have a different interpretation of the meaning of and. So Nigeria is basically, you know, a, a ringa ringa roses. We keep going round and round in circles. We've all been down this path before. That's what is so disturbing is that we refuse to learn from history and we insist on repeating the mistakes of history over and over again. So, obviously, the Supreme Court hasn't decided yet. Um, so we have to, as I said, approach with a measure of caution. Yes. But the Presidential Elections Petitions mm -hmm. Court has given its ruling, yeah. and you were there yeah. as it was being delivered. Yeah. At least you watched it. I watched it. Yeah. <laughs> 12 hours. Um, just very, very briefly, yeah. we've got about a minute and a half. Yeah. How do you assess that judgment? Well, you know, the technically they were right on some points mm. for example if the evidence wasn't filed you know with the petition uh, the problem with our legal process is that the objections of the council were not taken immediately because if they had been taken immediately oh you didn't file out of time guess what the court will assess a penalty you pay for filing out of time and the court will allow you file so it wasn't a fatal mistake. Those were not mistakes that should have killed the case. Mm. They could have been addressed early on. Uh, but I do think that while the technical evidence bits had challenges because the evidence was uh, ticked out, kicked out, the constitutional questions, which are cardinal, should have made the cases succeed. So uh, it's a mixed bag. I think our courts need to be more dynamic than mechanic. And right now we have mechanic, mechanic, you know, you know, letter, letter, letter. Mm. We need to get the spirit. If the constitutionals, the constitutions framers wanted to prevent fraudulent types from office, the courts should work hard to ensure that the spirit of the constitution right. is met. Okay, we'll keep our eyes on tomorrow. I yeah. want to thank you very much indeed. It's been brilliant. Always a pleasure you. to meet you, yeah. Charles. Emmanuel Ogebe is a, an international human rights lawyer, an expert on Nigerian election law, who is also a pro-democracy advocate with the US Nigeria Law Group in Washington and he's been in Nigeria monitoring the presidential election trial and the appeals process. Thank you ever so much. Thanks.